It's Thursday, February 6th, 2014. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights Tonight on the Geek Nights Book Club. Idoru by Gibson. Not the guitar. Let's Let's do this. this. I'm totally going to hack the Gibson. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So yeah, it's the book club. Yeah. Been a while. We've been busy. Let's, uh, should we discuss the next book first? Eh, we'll do a separate show talking about that. I don't want to waste time. All right. You guys are here to talk about Idoru or Idoru I or hope Idoru. I you read it because we're going to talk the hell of a lot about yeah. it. So guys, if you've never listened to the book club before, the point is that you've already read the book. We're going to assume you if read you it. If you had a book club in person where you had to meet people at the library in a little room with a table and chairs, would you show up not having read the book? No, you wouldn't. So we're going to assume you read it. We're not going to summarize the plot. We're going to spoil the ever-living fuck out of this book. Uh, uh, also, we read the book, and it's good, so you should read it. Yeah, you should read it. So if you so haven't read it... that's the review. Read this book. If you haven't read it, read it, and then come back and listen to this show. Po- positive experience reading this book. Would read again. I'm a lot better than uh, The Name of the Wind. <laughs> <laughs> By Times a Zillion. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, I just you know, we, we sometimes in the past book club episodes have or have not had news things a day, but I just so happen to have news and thing of day related to book. So that's my new thing. All right. I got a news that's also related to book. How about your thing of the day? My thing of the day is not. It's related to skeletons. Well, you fail. Skeletons are awesome. I love yeah, they are. So it's okay. okay. So here's my news, right? So have you ever heard of a guy named Max Martin? Max Martin. No, I know Miles Mayhem. Not even close. Max Power. No. So Max Martin is a dude that no one knows. Well, not no one, but he's not a famous person that people know. Uh Oh, discography. Yes. So pretty much for the past 15... Oh, I think I've seen this guy. For the past 15 to 20 years, this guy has basically written... Every almost every major hit pop song. Wow, you're right. Baby One More, all of Britney's. Oh, wow, NSYNC, Backstreet this, Boys. Right. So it's like you know all those super popular musical groups, right? That have super hit songs. That but they're not songwriters. They're just performers. Which is still you know people look down tend to look down on people. Like I mean, there's other reasons to look down on Britney Spears or NSYNC, right? But the point is. Regardless of whether they can write music or have creative talent or whatever, they have a performing skill that not everyone has, right? But you wonder, where does that... Someone's doing the songwriting. Who is it? This is the guy, right? So if you have some Hatsune Miku type shit going on in the future... It's really the Max Martins of the world, at least until we get computers that write their own music, that are going to be, you know, the real you know, human being behind the Aiduru, right? So there's this huge article on celebrity net worth that tells you everything you need to know about this guy who was pretty much a complete mystery uh, to most people or still is a complete mystery to most people. Um, and it's pretty fascinating, like, you know, this Swedish dude's life and how he did this and how, why he's so good at it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's worth reading about him and perhaps even Googling him to learn more or emulating him. That's actually pretty fascinating. It's, yeah. it's very relevant to what we're talking about. I it's think like, it, it's like, no, it really was. You think it's like anyone can write all these hip hop. Me- actually, no, only one guy can. This well, guy. that's the thing. Like, look at this Hatsune, guy in Daft Punk. And look at Hatsune Miku. Like right now, the character is an idol. Like she exists in that sense, mm-hmm. but she does not have her own agency or is creating works on her own. There are still humans filling that character with stuff. Mm-hmm eventually humans will seed AIs that make that stuff and all these share and Apple things are going to happen. Yep. So yeah, Mac, oh, here's the line. Here's the line I was looking for. Max Martin, he's personally responsible for churning out more Billboard singles than Michael Jackson and Madonna combined. <laughs> <laughs> so, my news is related only in the cyberpunk sense. Okay. So, uh, for those of you who haven't been following Google Glass... They Google finally announced they've sold real frames, just titanium frames that'll hold prescription lenses that just connect to Google Glass and they're official. What's funny is that they sold out of those frames immediately. Of course. I think they vastly underestimated the number of people with bad eyes who simultaneously bought glass and are explorers, even though there was no way for them to use them with glasses. You think maybe they could have just like you know, 
pretty much everyone who got glass got it through this glass experience. Yes, and you the think they could have just been like, you know, how's your eyesight, and just you know done it, counted them. We would have lied though, because they because I think everyone would have been afraid. Like if I have bad vision, they might not accept me. Unlikely. I don't know because they didn't did you, have a did decision. Did you lie? Yet. I would have. I would have lied. <laughs> you would have said, "Yeah, my eyesight's great." Yes, I would have shown up to pick him up without my glasses on. <laughs> did but you showed up with glasses on? Yes, and, and the guy was like. He looks at me and he kind of frowns and says, "Ah, uh, do you need those to see?" And I was like, "Yep." And he's like, "Uh, you sure you want glass? Really?" Oh, he wanted work. to refund you. Yeah, he wanted he wanted to talk me out of having glass. Okay. And I was like, "I'm just gonna hack something together." And he's like, "Well, don't take it apart because terms of service." And I was like, "Okay, I won't violate your terms of service." And I winked at him, and he looked at me like, "Ah." And then he sat me down. Of course, then I was like, okay, log in your Google account. So I go to mail.frontrowcrew.com. He's like, ah, Google domains. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, bet in a thousand. (laughs) So yeah, Google now has legit frames. I bought them. I found an optician who's willing to do the thing for me. I thought you said they were sold out. so they're almost sold out. They, well, I was able to get the last frame, like literally the last one, in one type because after I bought it, it said, it said sold out. It said stock one, and when you went back, it reloaded. Well, it, it said, said in stock, and after I bought it, it said out of stock. So you, someone else might have gotten the last one while you were checking out. Odds are I got the last one. Sure. I can't imagine there's that you much just want, You just got to imagine that you're special. But I got the wrong color, which is fine because the color is only on the inside, and my color was sold out in every type. There's one type that's not sold out because it's the ugly one. <laughs> you can get the ugly one right now if you want. You can't get any other ones. Okay. So You can get the ugly one and paint it. No, no, the shape is ugly. Oh. The shape is pretty bad. Okay. So You can twist it with the pliers. Nah, I'm basically <laughs> able to finally do what I've been wanting to do with glass the whole time is not have to wear this ridiculous hack and literally wear glass all the goddamn time. Mm. I've been wearing it about 60% of the time lately. I just don't wear it all the time, mostly well, because... Well, I take it off when I'm home, usually. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, there's two reasons I don't wear it all the time. Reason number one is that... The Pebble Watch sort of is redundant with Google Glass in a lot of ways, but the Pebble Watch actually, if you count only the functionality and not the fact that, you know, the Pebble Watch is not on your face all the time, giving it, you know, whatever, the Pebble Watch shows me every notification from my phone, period. Every yep. one of them. Which is not what I want, but this isn't the show to talk about right, that. Right, but Google Glass does not. So, But it, Pebble Watch also gives me all the notifications that Google Glass does. So if I have both, it's sort of like bzz, bzz, and it's like, I don't need that, yep. right? And the weather's not so good right now. So, like, I, I worry about, like, the rain and snow getting That's on. part of the reason why I'm not wearing them every day now. And also, the amount of time during the day that I would wear them, if I go, to, if I, it's like a day where I wake up, go to work, and come home, I'd be wearing glass for, like, what, a couple hours, an hour on the See, subway. now, that's the difference. This is why I think people who already wear glasses are at an advantage in the beginning. I have to wear glasses anyway. So wearing glass instead of just glasses is no different. So like wearing, might it, as well. wearing it when I'm at my desk in front of a computer is pointless. See, I wear it when I'm at my desk in front of my computer. What's the point? Well, one, because why take it off? It's the same as wearing glasses. So I just have this ability. But it's all its functionality is redundant with the computer that is in front of me. No, because it gives me notifications. I don't just compulsively check all my shit. I check all my shit so rapidly. I check. I, I can check all my shit multiple times a second. Yes, and, and I don't why. do that. I do work. <laughs> you, re- I, you realize I do work as well. I know. I, I just know. get the work done so fast. It's mostly that I get up. Whoosh, I, whoosh, whoosh. So I get up. I walk around a lot. I'm working on things. I can I'm, reload Gmail fat and like ten times and read it all. All the he- all the you know subjects of all the emails but here's the other and thing. do work fast b- by the time the notification comes in the glass when i'm doing some work like i don't I- i'll be doing work or whatever and what glass does is while i'm sitting there at the desk it'll pop up like any notification that matters that's the thing it shows me only things that i would actually care about seeing live doesn't show me any I other care shit about everything doesn't I, show me tweets i can absorb anyway i digress fingers. my yeah. point is i will finally be able to take a step toward my gargoyle cyberpunk future Because I'll be able to wear glass pretty much all the time now. Mm. Because now, with my hack, the the lenses I'm using are not designed to be exposed to stuff. They're supposed to be inside of a shield because I wear them skiing. So as a result, they're not scratch resistant at all. So I have to treat these things with kid fucking gloves. Mm -hmm. Because they're supposed to be protected by a shield. I'm wearing them naked and Protect the shield. Yeah. (laughs)
So things of the day. Mine is in no way related to this book. I just think it's awesome. So have you ever heard of a picture, a famous picture called Student's Dream? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so Except this actually I do because you showed me the thing the before the episode. Okay. But before then, I had no clue what you're talking Student's about. Student's Dream is a picture of, of someone laying on what looks like an old-timey uh, dissection table. And there's a bunch of real corpses just sort of hanging out around him. And it's super creepy looking. Mm -hmm. Kind of a famous photo. My thing of the day is a, a selection of photographs from the Burns archive of dissection photos, which sounds gross, but here's the deal. This is why this is cool. In the 1800s, in the early 1900s, there was sort of this rite of passage if you were going to be a doctor or a physician when you did your first dissection of a cadaver. So students would take pictures of themselves, basically selfies, with corpses. That was like the thing that doctors did. So these are all pictures of what look like nerdy RIT students just like taking a selfie next to a ridiculously rotted corpse. Okay. Some of these corpses were probably stolen because dissection was not actually legal in a lot of places, even though it was actually pretty necessary for medical science. Mm -hmm. So grave robbing was the thing to let doctors practice, and these pictures are kind of awesome and kind of disturbing. Okay. Also, I like the ones with the skeletons. Mm. Like, this guy just posed the skeleton wearing a top hat, like, hanging out with him. Oh, those are the best pictures. Yeah. Uh, but these are real human skeletons. Yeah. I need one of those. No, I don't. <laughs> I kind of I kind of want a contemplating skull. Mm. Like a human skull, a real one, just to put on the end table. So whenever I want to be contemplative... How do you know who you belong to? Don't care. You don't care? Because it's an empty shell now. The human's gone. What if it was someone you knew? Alas, Horatio, I knew him. What if it was someone you knew? <laughs> well, well, I did know him. He was the clown. Sure. <laughs> okay, so speaking of... Do not mail me a skull. <laughs> just making that clear. <laughs> Speaking of Iduru, right? I have Iduru related thing of the day. Here's some real idols. I don't know if I've talked about Crayon Pop on the show before. Uh, I tortured Rim with them, at least shortly. I'm, right? I'm, it's hard to say torture because I kind of enjoy this. Right. So the deal with Crayon Pop, right, is they're just another K pop group, at least nominally, right? You know, five pretty girls, whatever. They're in their 20s. They sing and dance catchy songs, just like all the other ones, right? What sets them apart from the other K pop groups is number one, the, uh, like, if you look at Girls' Generation, they were created by a giant company with tons of money, ultra-professional. This is basically, like, if we started an idol company and found some girls and tried to, like, make a K-pop group, that's what Crayon Pop is. They basically, like, walked around the street and performed on the sidewalk, which we would do in New York, until they got popular. And they just kept trying song after song until they finally let them on TV, right? Um... But they finally got super popular when they did this one song, and they had this trademark of wearing helmets when they do this jumping song. Scott shows me these videos. I'm like, so what? Hats are their thing? Right. And that sort of, it sets them apart from all the other K-pop groups because they wear, like, tracksuits and helmets as opposed to wearing, like, you know, being sexy, revealing, or anything like that. You know, that. I know another uh, song that was related to hats. Mm -hmm. Hatari Dean. <laughs> it is, right? <laughs> so anyway, there's a funny video here that someone made is they took just a performance that they did on TV of a different song and they put subtitles on it, but the subtitles are not the right subtitles. Oh, you know that, that, old, that genre. That genre where you play, just make up subtitles that say something else is not what they're actually saying. And the subtitles are basically like... We're not wearing the helmets again. Fuck you. They're really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, I think you sort of will only get the joke if you watch some of their other stuff and like understand uh, where they came from. Uh, but yeah, this shows that even in a world of virtual idols, you know, there is still merit in, I guess, the physical idol in some way. And it can, even the physical idol is still remixed and re manifested by, you know, the, I guess, it's not the consumer, but you know the per the the watchers, and not just the right. It's 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 participatory, whether it's Hasani Miku or whether it's you know the traditional old way of doing things with real people. Oh, singing participatory. And dancing. That's uh, there's a lot to say about that with uh, I don't know. They're actually girls. Uh, Crayon Pop is actually sort of extra participatory. Like they get closer to their fans, like physically speaking, than other groups do. Like you'll see them. Like it's like they actually at least seem to actually want to go meet their fans. And, like, you'll see when they're, like, dancing on the street, they'll let fans, like, carry the boombox for them and stuff like that. And it's kind of weird. Anyway. 
So, meta moment, very briefly, the next book club book will be Wool by Hugh Howey, because I've yeah, gotten... You, you have like 10 copies, right? I, I keep, people kept giving me copies right, of so this give book. give me one of them. Unrelatedly. If I, I'm, or do I have one? I'm going to kindle it. I don't carry books anymore. Okay. So, I'm not paying for a book that we have five free copies of. Well, the, you can take one of these books then. One of them is signed by the author, so I don't what know. Evs? I'm not sure who gave me that one. If you did, thanks, I guess. Whatever. Uh, so, we'll read it. A lot of people speak highly about this book. A lot of speak people speak highly about a lot of books. This a lot a of book. people spoke really highly about the King Killer Chronicle in the Name of the Wind. Sure. So. Actually, I found out about that book because it, uh, one of the Penny Arcade paper editions, the introduction was written by uh, Rothfuss. Yeah. 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 That's how I found out about that. But, I mean, a lot of people recommend that Ready Player One. I read that. Nah. I mean, yeah. it hits on all this nostalgia stuff, but it's basically the Woo game, the book. Guys, uh, read The Prince of Nothing and then come back to us and tell me your book is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Uh, I don't know. If I had so to we're say, skipping all meta moments, I guess? Yeah, yeah. videos, whatever. So Find us on the internet. Follow, read you the other us. book club Congratulations. books. Read the other book club books. That's right. There's read a books. bunch of old book club episodes. I read a study a week ago, two weeks ago, saying that literacy is you know at its level but adults in america are reading fewer books than in like the last 50 years mm -hmm. no one's reading books anymore that's right so read books you'll be smarter than all your friends then you'll start to hate your friends and they'll start to resent you and then you'll find smarter friends like us that's how that goes that's how it goes if i had to say one thing about adoru it's that it is so 90s. It is the most it 90s. Is like, it is like, take, take but I mean, we tend, I mean, all the cyberpunk, major cyberpunk works tend to be from the 90s, right? The snow crash is from the early 90s. Uh, Idol is from the later 90s, right? But it's like, all that shit is 90s because the, at that time period, it's like we had internet, it existed, right? We had computers, but they were so, you know, I immature. It was so early in the technology that, you know, the true future of it was mostly imaginings, right? So you're yep. able to, as an author, you could, like, imagine the future of computing, like, whoa, cyberspace, amazing, right? And you can even see that in the lowbrow medias, like, Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad or VR Troopers yep. or... Now, also remember, in this era, the internet, would, like, people use this technology, but, like, MMORPGs... Uh, cyberspace, MUDs and MUX, those existed. Cyberspace existed at that time. Barely. But it did exist, and mm -hmm. there were people who were involved in it. But because those spaces were so prevalent, and there was interest, in, like VR was big at the time, There's there was definitely this idea that cyberspace is all about hidden identities, virtual identities, your life in you know the web or the net or whatever they call it is radically different from your real person. Goes in the shells in the 90s. Yep. But uh, that was like such a common, deep, unavoidable theme of all cyberpunk, of all tech writing, everything in the pop culture around the internet was about avatars and personas and shared spaces mm -hmm. and cyberspaces, which really kind of died. Like that whole idea is not part of the internet consciousness anymore. Right. Well, what happened is, you know, people imagine sort of, you know, they took the technology that was available and so early and then extrapolated like, you know, what could it be like and what, what they wanted it to be like, right? And, you know, took that out into the future and like, what would happen if thing, right? And now it's it's developed since then and now we see the reality and the limits of technology and we're like, oh, this is what it actually is. But at the same time, we have a lot more capabilities than were imagined even then. Sure, in most they just cases. weren't the ones that we thought of necessarily. Well, guess, some of them are the ones we thought of and some of them are I aren't. guess what's interesting is that the ones that we thought of in the 90s are eminently possible, it's just no one gives a shit. Sure. Like the, the the whole idea of like the shared spaces, the avatars, like meet with someone in a really like hyper realistic. Well, because the way it was imagined was that be like you'd jack in with goggles on your head and you'd actually see it would be like you're actually there for reals. Yeah. You know, and you wouldn't, you know, but actually, no, that's not how it is because that technology has not. So let's that see what happens because that technology that is coming in the next decade, like in a big way. I hope so. It is. I mean, Oculus Rift is not a lot, but you know what? It's the equivalent of Google Glass in the sense that it's the first consumer-level usable thing like that. Maybe. it's th That <laughs> stuff's coming. Yeah. But simultaneously, it's not just what we imagined the future to be based on the internet, but 
all these cyberpunk works are very dystopian. Mm. And they're dystopian in such a 90s way. The example I always use, my go-to example, is the movie Strange Days. Mm -hmm. Set in 1999. It's actually very similar to the world of Idoru. Mm -hmm. And the dystopias are always the same. Geopolitics kind of remains static. Like, Russia is still the sort of Soviet thing. Mm -hmm. Which it's really not anymore, but I qualify that because it's kind of going back in that direction lately. <laughs> like, China is still this, like, outsourced hellhole in a lot of these dystopias. Racial tensions are a big deal mm -hmm. in a lot of 90s cyberpunk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the, because remember, that was a big deal in 90s society. There were, there were riots. The racial tensions were in the media in a big way. Urban crime was still a problem. In Snow Crash, they made a big deal. Raven was a black guy. Yep. It's important. These, these, uh, these cyberpunk dystopias always focused on cities become full of gangbangers. Was he an American guy? I forget. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Either way, he was, he was, you know, specifically he was the guy who was not the white guy or the Asian guy. Cities were dystopian and filled with, like, Fist of the North Star looking bad guys running yeah. around like crazy, raping and murdering. Look at RoboCop. <laughs> like, that's the kind of future that was envisioned. And Idoru is so stereotypical of... 90s like future dystopia mm -hmm. that it almost feels cliche if you forget that it was written in the 90s right it's, this is another one of those examples where you look at we, we were looking at Amazon reviews and we think we might do this all the book clubs but like look at a few Amazon reviews for the book and, and discuss them <laughs> and laugh at them maybe yeah. but a lot of a lot of people talked about how the book is sort of cliche and it's like Dude, this book like invented a lot of those cliches. In fact, that's the kind of book you te that tends to end up being a book that is famous is a book that invents things. Why do you think Shakespeare? That's like Shakespeare's number one reason for being so famous because like he invented all that shit. Well, it's not that he invented them so much as he was he is the conscious beginning for most people who would know about those things. Sure, he presented them for the first time, so he gets credit for it. And it doesn't matter whether he invented it or not; he might as well have invented it. Like Thomas Edison invented a light bulb. Yeah, sure, right? It was there light bulbs before him yeah it was the other guy yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like okay it doesn't matter right? the first light bulb that people were buying and using in their houses was thomas edison light bulb so so most of the complaints about this book from amazon seem to be that it's cliched or it's complicated i can't <laughs> you can't it, be both i can't imagine usually simple Ah, uh, God, what a waste. Throughout the entire book, I just wanted to chuck it. There's nothing new here. This is a rehash. <laughs> nothing new in this 90s book. <laughs> the plot is unoriginal and plotting. The characters are very poorly developed, even for Gibson. Okay, well, the characters poorly developed is somewhat true, right? Is that he only develops the characters that really have to be developed, right? And all the other characters are sort of just static through the whole book. It's like, you know, and it's really more about... You know, the world and the plot as opposed to any particular character growing or changing. Well, I mean, look, right? the characters are all nothings. They do. In fact, the, all the main characters, everything just happens around them and they don't actually do anything. Yeah, the story is like, you know, the plot and the, the conflict is all about, you know, Rez and, and you know, the, the Aiduru and the company. But you don't see that. You see, like, you're coming into this situation from really far away from these two perspectives of, you know, Lainey and Chia, right? These two characters yep. from far away. And, and it, it does, cyberpunk books all do this thing, where the, at least a lot of them do, where there's the two characters and it goes back and forth. That might just be because a lot of it's Gibson and Diamond he does Age that. did the same thing that Stevenson. Yeah, Gibson and Stevenson write very similarly. Snow Crash did the same thing. Anyway, but it's like these two characters are coming from far away, and you're seeing things from their perspective, and those are the people who are you know have some character development right and change throughout the course of the book, and they come, they're getting closer to the situation all the time, right? And it's, so it's like the real plot is happening, but you can only see what these two characters see as they get close to it. And then they pass by each other, right? And that's the climax of the book. And then the book ends. So, Basically, all right, I found <laughs> the best review. Okay. The best. Let's make this shtick where we read only the best Amazon review. What do you call it when you take someone, some other people's idea and call it your own? This is what this book is all about. Gibson takes the Idoru theme, which is overused and abused in Japanese anime, to create a story that is neither original nor interesting when compared to your average anime. You could, that was a valid criticism if that book came out today, but it didn't come out today. It came out in the 90s. So. Uh, this one's equally good. Perhaps I'm not the brightest fellow. Well, he's right on one point. <laughs> 
But I really had no clue what Gibson was writing about. The whole cyberpunk thing never happened, so I well, likely okay, never... Well, so, okay, so the cyberpunkness of the book is usually you imagine, like, Snow Crash, where they're going in cyberspace all the time, right? Which is or not actually the biggest right? ideas in most cyberpunk right. literature. But in this, there's only a little bit of that, right? Is there's the, 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 the place is not cyberspace in general, right? It's that sort of recreation of the... Um, the what's it called the the underground city place what's the name of it I forget oh the the, the, the walled city the K file yeah, no the yeah the walled city yeah, place right gr- and, a shared K file right and it's like you know it's like they don't they only go there a little bit right it's only that p- place and the si- the going into cyberspace stuff is only relevant to Chia really it's not really relevant to Laney so like half the book doesn't even involve that at all right and it's like for Laney it's just he's basically like a DVA <laughs> yeah right <laughs> he's know? good at, you know what he's good at doing surfing the internet and ignoring dumb shit well, I think what he's actually, you know, that is true, right? Is that he he's he basically has the skill of looking at data and then understanding it, right? And it's relevant to today where people talk about like the government collecting metadata and it's like if you know this fact and all these separate facts that seem unrelated, you can actually more information emerges when you combine them and Laney's skill is basically seeing that, right? So he can see, aha, this person bought tea at two o'clock, uh, and this person, you know, uh, sat down and watched this TV at 2.30, and that person's location was, you know, this, he got on that subway train at that time. This person went and had tea with that person at their house, right? It's like you, you draw the conclusions from these unrelated datas. Yep. Uh, and now, that idea... They come up with a fancy word for it. They're like, oh, he finds the, the nodal, nodal points. points. It's like, yeah, no, you, you're basically just extracting real data. But that kind of idea data. was not super widespread in popular consciousness in the 90s. No, not really. Oh, here, here's another review. There wasn't enough data storage in the 90s to do that. I'll point at the last uh, dumb review, and then we'll talk more about the book. This is a simplistic sci-fi novel, more concerned with punk than futurism. Eh, Little so original or thought-provoking material past the one seminal idea that identity and fame are fast-becoming commodities, which are created and sold. Yeah, the 90s, that was that was what was happening. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Well, on the on the fact that it wasn't futuristic, that is true. This this book does have one problem that I notice in a lot of just sci-fi in general, anything that's, you know, takes place in the future and that Many things are highly advanced. They're going in a jacket in the cyberspace with their brains going to virtual worlds, and then they have a fax machine. Yep. So like, really, like, we don't like even have fax have machines. To upgrade. They, he goes to the airport, and there's a luggage carousel, and it's like, okay, I can see the luggage carousel. Well, I mean, yeah, today we still have luggage carousels, but if I well, was like, writing a book in the '90s, I would imagine something better than luggage carousels. I would make sure that in every you know, scene that I wrote, every single technology in that scene would at least be updated or replaced in some way. Well, you so, know what it's like you when know, you watch... That's uh, actually maybe a, you know, so it's like, how do you decide when you're writing a book like that, which things to upgrade and which not to? Because you're going to be wrong I think, with the fax machine and you're going to be right with the luggage carousel. I think it's just the blindness of your era that, for example, Total Recall... Your editor should see that shit, though. Maybe, but Total Recall, though, you'll be blind to this stuff. They think, oh, it's a dystopian future where there's ads everywhere, so let's put screens everywhere with ads on them. So the screens are all these giant CRTs hanging everywhere Mm -hmm. in a future with space travel. Yep. Like, no one thought flat panels. No one thought of, like... Actually, uh, Total Recall had some flat screens, like the one in his wall in his bedroom. Yeah, but it also had a lot, also of, had a lot of huge CRT. CRTs hanging out, just like everywhere. It did indeed. Or like, uh, well, in this book, what really stood out was that the book didn't really, at any point, seem to consider the idea that wireless communication would exist. <laughs> <laughs> like, they like everything's wired, even though the data being transferred is not that much. And two, they seem to like be focused. Like, there's a lot of IR being used. Remote controls are mentioned at multiple points. IR remote controls. Mm. Like, those are the two things that stood out the most to me in terms of the technology being disparate. Mm. All right, let's talk about what actually happens in the freaking book, right? All right, so I-, I think the book is like the whole. He wants to date an idol thing is really it's all it's just it's like the difference engine. It's just a, a canard to bring up all these ideas and see what's going on. I think the book's about fandom, yep. it's about fame, and it's about AI. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also about, you know, the information, right? It's like you have the, the the real thing that happens is not that he wants to marry the idol, right? It's that he's able to get 
you know, the 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 at the truth because it was created by you know all the information uh, of all the fans, right? Uh, well, by networking all the just like in in Ghost in the Shell where he networks all the dudes in his pachinko parlor, right? Oh yeah, is it's like. You know, the I, where did the idol's intelligence come from? The idol's intelligence came from all the things that all of the fans of the idol did on the internet together. It's like you combine all the fan forums and all the, you know, the fan arts and the fan everythings together, and that is, you know, gave life to the virtual idol. And that's exactly what, that's even more Hatsune Miku than just, and, and more, it's even, you know, Sharon Apple doesn't even have that aspect at all, right? Yeah. It's even... So accurate because that's a, yeah, right. Well, there's well, you know, I said AI because really, it, there's this point that information is the only thing that actually matters or exists in some senses. Mm -hmm. Like information is its own plane of existence, and that AIs arise. Because remember, they they mentioned a couple times that she is the epitome of desire. Mm -hmm. That the art, the idol is the epitome of desire. Fans desire her. Res desires people desire her. And I think the turning point. For an active AI, or that what makes this interesting is when that turns into the thing itself now having desire. That's the collective, reflective desire of all the things desiring it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the book's about fandom too, because notice it makes it's kind of a side point that doesn't require any of this cyberpunk stuff at all. That she is a fan. You're, you're a lot of you kids are fans of things. Some of you are, some of you are at least one of you is a fan of us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Your image of us is a carefully constructed media image. You have a flat data set of us. Mm -hmm. the, you, the, the us you think of is not quite the us that we really are. So your perceptions of us are very much colored by being a fan. And notice how Chia, as soon as she meets the real Rez, like he's not a bad guy. No. He's kind of a chill guy. But in that moment, when she sees like the three-dimensional view, when she gets more information about him, suddenly she's not a fan anymore. Like, she has seen beyond the curtain and is in this whole new plane of information and existence. Mm -hmm. Like, it's no longer a central part of her life. It's almost kind of an adolescent story on the side. Like, she sort of grows up just by experiencing all of this. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also interesting, right, is that the plot is about Rez wants to marry this idol, right? He's not, you know, and it's like, you know, why, why does it have to be that, right? It's like, it's sort of what's happening is the thing that can never happen, Right, if the the idol is basically the combination of all the fans together, granted it intelligence, he's marrying all the fans. Yeah. Right. You think about it that way. It's like the one thing that the, never happens: the famous person marrying a fan. Right. It's like no, he's actually marrying every fan at once. But notice how the fan that has the true picture mm -hmm. has a very different view yep. and is not a part of that flash mob. Mm -hmm. Doesn't even tell people about it. Nope. Just kind of stays away, fades back. I love that little point that Rez says he's going to come and like talk to her later and thank her, and then he just never fucking shows up. No. Why like, I like that bit. Like, he just completely forgot she existed. Mm -hmm. So, but in terms of Chia as an adolescent story, notice how Gibson uses, like, whenever ever we see things from her perspective, she doesn't know stuff. Nope. She's she's very well written as a dumb punk kid. Mm -hmm. Like she just doesn't know stuff at all. And she describes things like she keeps describing the lady next to her on the plane drinking that carrot juice with the celery sticking out of it or the tomato juice with the celery sticking out of it. Not really putting together that, that those are Bloody Marys. It's alcohol. She's getting herself <laughs> drunk. It, she like she just glosses over all this. She doesn't know history. She doesn't know much about like the Soviet Union or politics she knows or about anything. Res. It's all she knows about. <laughs> but it's written in a from a very naive perspective. Like and he's also making this point about how youth culture increasingly has access to information and yet at the same time doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Cuz remember there's that little anecdote where she's talking about how the two meshbacks in her class were fighting over whether you draw the crooked ends of the cross that the teachers always yell at them about the right way or not. Obviously Nazis. Yeah. Obviously, uh, Swastika. She has no idea nope. what that is. Right, because he's, he's imagining this in a future, and he's sort of being like, you know, yeah, that in the future, World War II will have been even longer ago than it is now, right? You think kids now don't know history. Kids then are really not going to know history. But that scene also had a funny moment where then she says something about it's like when they would shot they would build those stun guns out of disposable cameras and shock each other like really disposable film cameras with flashes still exist yep. in this far future 
Fax machines. <laughs> Fax machines. Well, probably still exist because our laws are so out of date. All right. So, so talking about Laney, right? So Laney worked for this company that was basically the shitty newspaper or the TMZ. It's almost like TMZ New York Post, but the biggest newspaper in the world because people only care about vapid entertainment in this dystopian future. Yeah. It's obvious that that commoditized fame is everything and it's all manufactured. Mm hmm. But at the same time, true fame shines through <laughs> somehow. Yeah. Uh, you know, but that, you know, he leaves because the, you know, he, uh, the uh, conflicts, <laughs> the boss, I guess. Also, and his he, uh, his personal conflict over letting that girl kill herself. All right. Oh, so let's talk about the girl that killed herself. Right. So, you know, he goes, you know, into the, the his information. He sees that this thing is going to happen. He goes to try to do something about it. Right. But he doesn't tell any like he goes personally to do it. He kind of acts like the stalker weirdo that everyone's afraid he might be. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have that ability. Right. I mean, that's that's something that we have to deal with, you know, today. It's like, yeah, I'm going to look up information about things on the Internet. At what point am I a stalker weirdo? Right. It's like, you know, I don't know. Yeah. But at the same time, remember, he in the book has this power because of a weird drug test done on him as a kid in the orphanage. Oh, uh, yeah, that's just sort of silly. That whole but thing. at the same time, the danger is that that drug makes you a psychotic stalker. Yeah. But you could argue... Apparently he's the one guy who didn't become the psychotic stalker from the drug and all the other people did. Maybe there's this more subtle point there that having the ability to see that information... Remember, this is the world before... I can just go to Google and get all that kind of metadata myself. Mm -hmm. We have Laney powers now just because of technology. Yep. All of us do. Back then, and when this book was written, and in the world of this book, normal people cannot do that. Nope. The only people, who, only person who can do that is Laney. So maybe it's having that ability alone makes you a stalker. Mm. It guarantees you'll become a stalker. And even Laney, who is not as far gone and not as fucked up as all the other people who use this drug, he's still kind of a weirdo stalker. Mm. But I guess since he's the only one... Imagine if one person ha had an iPhone that could Google, went back in time, and they still had somehow modern internet and could Google, right? You're going to fucking hire that person. <laughs> yep. Right? Even though... Even though he doesn't do... That person would have such a vast power. Like, if I just took my iPhone back to the 90s and somehow it still had an internet connection to today, my you know, discounting things like Back to the Future lottery ticket winning. Yeah, just right? like Wikipedia knowledge for right. dates up to that point. Yeah, it's like... I would be so powerful, it would be hard not to do evil things just from human nature, unless I was fucking Dalai Lama or some shit. Right? It would be so easy. It's good to know you're on the shit list of uh, if you get dark powers, destroy you. <laughs> yeah. If I get dark powers, you won't be able to destroy me. I'm of the camp of use dark powers to do Strike good. Strike me down and I will become more powerful <laughs> than you can <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So, was it just me, or were the, was the Russian mob really kind of funny and derpy? Like, I, it's not just... Well, the they were fighting against funny and derpy, too. I mean, what's his name? The strong guy? Oh, he is the best. Blackwell? Of course. Oh, yeah, right? So, it's like, Blackwell is already kind of funny, right? He's awesome and funny, though, right? He's just, you know, the, the stereotypical, gigantic, badass dude who's, you know, but he Super wasn't... Super graceful. Right, but and he wasn't just, you know, this dumb muscle. It's like they took... The smart guy and the muscle guy, and they put him in the same body, right? And and that sort of makes it a really interesting and awesome character to to root for or whatever. Yeah, he's also ruthless, but in this very calculating and kind of loyal yeah. way. But it's like you sort of need, right? If you're gonna have this, he's he's not comic relief because he's not you know like slapstick, but he's like enjoyable. Like you, you yeah. smile in his, when he's there, right? The Russian mafia guys are kind of like that too. Right, you need that kind of you know. You can't have that guy fighting a serious enemy, right? That's why you'll have like in an action movie, there'll be the you know the main character will be more serious, and the slapstick guy is like uh, the guy waiting for Bruce Willis in the car, right? And it's like Bruce Willis can't fight a silly enemy; he's got to fight the serious enemy. And so, right, so you have to match up the guy against the right enemy. So you need that Russian mafia enemies there to fight against uh, Blackwell. So you match up correctly. So look at how. Not just the main characters, but basically every character in the story doesn't have access to all the information. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And as a Neither result, does the reader. I mean, we have more than most because we're getting two angles at yep. least, at least two angles, right? But we're still, you know, we're basically adding those two together to find our own. But notice how point. the story does this. It basically, every chapter, the character has some fundamental question that's basically answered by the other character's perspective in the next chapter. Yep. So as a reader, we get all the answers ongoing. It's like, I wonder what that's about. Next chapter. Oh, that's exactly what that's right. about. Well, like I said, we're we're seeing our own nodal point in the book, <laughs> right? The nodal point in the Love Hotel, <laughs> eventually. But notice how the characters, every character, except the idol herself, mm-hmm. does not see fucking anything and doesn't fucking do anything nope they're just kind of bumping around in the dark bumping into stuff until eventually things work out and only at the very end when laney gets all the information and that kind of dumb explanation of how he sees it which i think was not really well written no it was a little weird it was very it, it was like they were, it was like trying to describe what hacking in the movie hackers looks like yeah <laughs> but only then did he figure it all out but we have that power today with google yep But the book gives you that power while reading it. You learn every answer along the way just because you can see from multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. The book is so meta, right? It's about a guy who finds nodal points. But while you're reading the book, the book is you finding a nodal point. Oh, my God. Yep. Oh, my Uh, God. The really the, the the joy of this book is in all the tiny little details because either they're really anachronistic, like the situation with Russia is just kind of outdated and silly, mm-hmm. but there's little details about nanotech. Like nanotech is not a big part of the book, other than it's kind of the next step for the story. Mm-hmm. Like that's the goal. Was obviously they wanted the nanotech to build a city like the shared kill file in the real world. But they still have fax machines. They can't just nano build a piece of paper on the other side. But <laughs> there's that little point about how nanotechnology is extremely extremely illegal. Yep. And that makes sense because self It's extremely it seems to also be the most powerful thing, right? It's like, yeah, with this little thing you can build a whole fucking city. You know, well, that's basically like, you know, that's a ridiculously powerful thing. Or remember in Diamond Age, the seeds that could do that on their own were ridiculously dangerous. Yep. I mean, yeah, I'll just plant this motherfucker in New York. Oops. You know what's funny? Double I, city. Because I'm, reading, I'm reading yet another culture book. I'm reading a service detail. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole idea of smatter and smatter infections or smatter uh, swarms or self homogenizing swarms is the term. It's the idea that in the galaxy, periodically, out of nowhere or out of somewhere, a homogenizing swarm will just appear. And it's nanobots that are trying to make more of themselves. Uh, either they came out of a civilization that fucked up and destroyed itself with nanotech, <laughs> which happens kind of often, just <laughs> out in the galaxy. Well, if you count the whole universe, yeah, you're going to find those. Yep, like every day, somewhere, some planet goes, up, oh, Grey Goo. <laughs> and they call them smatter infestations. And, they, and every now and then they flare up in different parts of the galaxy and the culture goes and deals with them. Mm. So it's kind of it's kind of like that. They, a, a nanotech device of the scale that's discussed in this book would be more powerful than the most powerful nuclear weapons. Yeah. I mean it's you know you think about it, it's like that could you could build an orbital with that motherfucker. Yeah. If you programmed it, right? Space doesn't seem to be a big deal in this. No. Not, not a lot of space. I mean, they don't even really talk about satellites or anything. I don't know how their net's working. Well, the net appears to be sort of pseudo-mythological. Like, Zona Rosa had that knife that was actually an application that was super illegal. And people build, like, houses inside of other people's websites. Oh, yeah, they make a big deal also about um, the computer, the her, I guess, her, her deck or computer. Oh, her, or her the sandbenders, the yeah, artisanal the sand computer ben- made right. by Indians. She's basically got, like, a hippie computer. It's made by hippies. As yep. A, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a computer from Whole Foods and not a computer from Newegg. Yeah, computers have gotten to the point, and you see this in some more, like, more current science fiction seems to get to this point where young people use technology that's so far beyond understanding that it is kind of mystical to them. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of this offhand. I'll think of one later. Yeah, but it's interesting how you imagined a world where it's like her software is completely different from everyone else's software, right? It's like the Sandbender software is like, whoa, it's totally different, and you know they don't use the same stuff as everyone else. And it's like in the real world, it's like you got three choices. Yes, <laughs> you know, it's like maybe that's Linux, but no, not even. Right? Oh yeah, and by, that was David Bowie, guys. If you didn't notice, oh, really? in the Sandbenders, no. Yeah, I don't think a lot of kids know who David Bowie is because this was nineties. Yeah, nineties guys. <laughs> <laughs> the Music Man, Labyrinth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, this book is actually really simple, really yeah, straightforward. And it brings up 
kind of interesting, obvious ideas. If you ignore the kind of broken anachronisms and remember that it was written in the 90s, like it's about fame, it's about AI, it's about information, yeah. it's about having Google. <laughs> It's it's kind of right. It's sometimes it's not exciting to read. It's like this thing was way more exciting to read when none of these things happened yet. Yeah. Right. It's like if you watch Ghost in the Shell, it's still exciting because it's like, yeah, I want my cyborg body, and I, you know, we've been waiting for the cyborg bodies for a while. Yeah. And we have some, but no, not even close. Um, but yeah, reading something that's like, oh my god, what if we had Google? And it's like I have Googles. Right, so the some of the excitement is lost, some of the pure. But remember, nineteen ninety six, the realm, the first graphical MMORPG launched that year. Right, so it's lacking some of that surface level excitement stuff. But as long as you keep it in perspective, right, uh, of the time it was written and such, you know, there's there's a lot to see here because there really weren't two. I mean, I'm not say it's not like Snow Crash, where like yeah, it was the first, but yeah, a lot of these I, particular ideas in here were the first time you see them in a major popular novel. I'd say this book overall has a 50%, like a, it's batting 500 in terms of how much of what it predicted is real or progressing in that direction mm. for real. Mm -hmm. Like the information stuff, the fandom and fame and culture stuff is going in that direction, but then aspects of it are not. Like the... Uh, the sort of dystopian burb clave ads everywhere. Media has literally gone to shit. Doesn't it hasn't really happened yet. No. Like we're not on that path. There's most media is like that. Aspects of that that exist. But we haven't like gone off the deep end. Actually, I'd think the percentage of that type of media is holding pretty constant over the decades. But yeah, I think it. You know, wait for the old people to die. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Uh, it's definitely, it's still worth reading, right? And it's not just the cyberpunk technology aspect, right? But the 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 culture of fame and idleness aspect. So right? I guess think so of you, it more... You're getting two for one. Don't, don't think that it's just share an apple or whatever. Think of it more like that. It's This is about information, metadata, and the future of fame and what fame is and, and if fame matters. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.